I'm Brian Johnson. I'm the publisher of Mass Device um, and Medical Design and Outsourcing Magazine and the host tonight of Device Talks. I hope you all have enjoyed uh, what is thus far a terrific evening. You guys really showed up here, and I'm really proud and uh, excited of the event we have tonight. Um, I got up here. I'm from Boston, so I decided uh, no weather jokes and no sports jokes. Uh, but um, you guys are... Uh, we, we have been investing heavily in Minnesota, uh, particularly in our relationships with organizations like Life Science Alley. And this market is particularly important to us. And we really love the phrase, Minnesota nice. Um, I don't know if I buy it. I'm from Boston. We, don't, we tried nice once or twice, but it just didn't work out. <laughs> but if we, really, if, we, if we went with the nice thing, we wouldn't have this great country of ours. So <laughs> thank you for coming. So an event like this doesn't get going without sponsors and partners. And we have some terrific partners and sponsors with us tonight. And I want to take a moment to recognize them. Uh, first of all, like I said, Life Science Alley has been a partner of ours uh, on this event and throughout the country and uh, raising the profile of the medical alley uh, throughout our large national audience. And we're delighted to do so. Um, Advamed 2015. Their conference is coming up in two weeks in San Diego, and they're going to bring that conference here to the Twin Cities next year. Um, so in your tickets, <laughs> Ray wants me to say that you all have been committed now to uh, registering at full price for next year's conference. But all kidding aside, really, I, I said it a little bit earlier, the Avamed conference is a great opportunity to energize the local community and show the rest of the medical device industry what you guys are all about. When we did it in Boston in 2012, we still have the record for the most attendees. And I got to be honest, guys, you're not beating us. <laughs> Manny says, wait until next year. Uh, but get involved. It's a great way to network, great way to meet people. Uh, it's a terrific conference. Come out to San Diego in two weeks, and we can do this all again. I know that Life Science Alley is going to have a reception out, uh, out there as well. So I hope to see everybody out there uh, in October 5th. I also want to uh, recognize our series sponsors, NPR, Travelers, J29 Associates, Halloran Consulting Group, and Greenberg Trarg. Uh, they are terrific sponsors. They're with us all year at all three events. We hold this in Boston, we hold this here, and we hold it in Orange County, California. And uh, we're delighted to have them with us, as always. They're great collaborators. And all of our sponsors have uh, some, some booths in the back. So please make sure that you get a chance to visit them and thank them for tonight's uh, opportunities. And also, finally, I would like to thank Surpass and MDRG, our event sponsors here in Minnesota. Um, you guys are terrific, terrific hosts. And uh, we're just thrilled to be here tonight. So that's enough of my monologue. I'd like to uh, now bring up our first speaker tonight, Manny Villafana. And I don't think Manny needs an introduction. Do you? Um, OK. <laughs> You got off easy. I did. <laughs> right here. Sir. Okay. So, Manny, I, I, really, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Um, this has not been an easy summer for you, to say the least. And I don't know if people know, but uh, your company, Kips Bay Medical, you uh, stepped down yesterday as CEO, and tomorrow we're filing dissolution papers for the company. So I, I think it's uh, terrific of you to come here tonight and, and share your experience with us. I, it can't be easy. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm here with friends, and, uh, and that makes it much easier. Uh, I think everyone understands. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was talking to Jeff tonight, and uh, the gentleman I just met for the very first time, and we were talking, and he said, 
Manny, you can't have successes without failures. Uh, I just spent eight years in the development of a technology that I feel is, is a great technology, a good technology. Um, but I did not anticipate that the regulatory path would be so, so trying and so difficult. And uh, also when we started the company, we raised money, but we raised money at the worst time in the market. We were raising money during the years of 2008, 2009. And if you guys don't know what that means is that the market was down at 6,500 uh, and it was just extremely difficult. We raised some money, enough to get started, but it wasn't our original target. So as a result of all that, combining those two things together, uh, the technology was difficult, difficult to teach. We had, we had some problems, but we were making progress. But every time we made progress, the FDA required us to give more and more information. And every time they, they raised a bar on you, that's another 10 or $15 million. In today's exercise downstairs, was it downstairs or upstairs? I don't remember. <laughs> it was okay. downstairs. All right. The, um, the chart was put on your table to, to create a company. And I, uh, I told Brian and Ray that I took that chart and I put an extra box on the bottom. And the guys I was working said, what's the box for, Manny? I said, now watch. The box was to say, the other things that you have to understand when you're developing a company is that, first of all, is there a need? But then the next thing is, what do you have in a design of that product that makes it more uh, or easier to finance? The next thing in your box is, what about the regulatory path? Is it, is it a doable regulatory path? OK, all of those things nobody talked about, OK? And so remember that when you're you're designing companies. Did you talk about those when you were founding Gibbs Bay? Oh yeah, we did that. And like I said, we were trying to raise a certain amount of money and the market went to hell in a handbasket. And, uh, and I remember clearly that Jeffrey's company, which is a major New York company, was saying we're gonna raise for you $57 million. And all the paperwork was done, done, sealed, delivered. But then the market just went down and the capital markets would not come back up. I finally ran out of my initial seed capital money. So we went to another firm that said, Manny, we'll do it. We can't raise you 57, but we'll raise. And they raised us uh, $16 million, which was enough to get started. But in the long term, it was just not enough, period. So what do you think? Did you need the 57 million in terms of initial capital? Yeah, we, we, we were raising 50. And Jeffrey said, no, we're going to do 57. Don't ask me where that 57 came from, but that, they, that's what they felt they could do. It's a fee. And, and remember one thing. Yeah. When you're doing a company, you never leave money on the table. OK? <laughs> right. <laughs> All right? Remember that one, too. Right. So there's, I mean, there's sort of a popular phrasing or meme going around the entrepreneur set that says, oh, failure is just as important as success. You've had so much success. <laughs> And, and I'm reticent to call Kips Bay a failure. I mean, I think what you achieved was terrific on its own. But I mean, I, I have to get your opinion on that statement as somebody who has. Uh, you hey, you know, um, I, I, I grew up in the Bronx, guys, South Bronx. And if I looked out, the, out my window over the building, if I went up to the roof and looked out the window, I could see a, a little place that had was called Yankee Stadium. And in Yankee Stadium, there was a guy that was playing ball there called Mickey Mantle. And everybody knows Mickey Mantle. If you don't know Mickey Mantle, you can leave the doors out the side and go inside. OK? Uh, I think but Marie's kids are, are uh, exempt uh, from that. Marie's yeah. children are exempt. OK, I'll tell you later who Mickey Mantle was, OK? <laughs> anyway, Mickey Mantle, of course, is known as being one of the greatest players of all time. But very few people know that he held a record for the most strikeouts, OK? And very few people know that he was sent to the minors. Very few, very, very, very few people know that he was sent to the minors twice. Now, most people would have said, he's, he's washed up, he's, you know, the whole thing. But he came back every day, even after having, you know, going 0 for 4 the day before, okay? And he got up, and he kept swinging the bat. And that's how I kind of look at these things. You know, when you strike out, you don't want to strike out too often because they will send you for the minors forever, but... Uh, I'm not afraid to swing the bat. And many times people have come to me and said, Manny, don't worry about it. We invest in you. 
because we believe in you and we know that you will pick up the bat tomorrow morning and swing again. I mean, what keeps you swinging the bat? You've had, I mean, I, if I had founded some of those companies, I might have been tempted to uh, call it. Uh, call it a day? Well, I don't know. I might have, yeah. might have decided to go part time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's several reasons, and I won't go into a lot of them, but, but I enjoy work, and I enjoy what I do. And if I have time here, can I tell a little story? Yeah, just a little teeny weeny little story. Sure, you got the mic. A little teeny weeny story, okay. So I was uh, working on, with uh, some finance people, a young, young man in the, in, uh, was questioning me, and, and finally he said, Manny, what, why are you doing this? You don't have to do this anymore. Why do you continue to do this? And I said, let me tell you a story. I went to uh, Spain one day, and they were doing uh, heart transplants. I'd never seen a heart transplant. I don't, I don't know how many of you have seen an actual heart transplant. And so I said to the surgeon, I said, you know, his name was Enrique uh, Rodriguez. I said, Enrique, you know, I have never seen a heart transplant. He says, well, are you going to be here this weekend? I says, yeah. He said, we'll do one. And I said, how do you know you're going to do one? Come on over here, Manny. He opens up the window overlooking Madrid. Not all of Madrid, but the neighborhood, you know. And there was a lot of motorcycles going around, you know, the little mopeds and stuff like that. And he says, notice something? Nobody's wearing helmets. And he said, in the weekend, there will be twice as many out there. And I can guarantee you we will have a heart transplant. I'll call you at your hotel. So sure enough, I don't know if it was Friday night, Saturday night, he calls me up to the hotel, 2 o'clock in the morning. I get up and, you know, get my way over to the hospital, get changed, and walk into the OR, and there are big bright lights and everything happening. Okay, and I, I stood at the end of the table where there's a drape, where you can look over the drape and see what's happening, okay? And there was a little table right over here. And there was the patient, okay? Surgeon was standing here, another couple of surgeons over here. And I look over the drape, and there is the, the chest is open, there's the heart. And it's beating, etc. And then all of a sudden, the door slams open, and there's a guy with a, with a uh, face mask just holding it. He didn't tie it on, just a face mask. And he has in his hand a little cooler, a little Coca-Cola cooler, igloo, whatever you want to call them. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, and there's ice at the bottom. And then in a standard Ziploc bag, you know, you carry sandwiches to work, there's a heart. <laughs> okay? And... Being a few, few words in Spanish, and, and then he leaves. And they take the heart and they put it on the table, that little table that's right here, and I'm standing right there. They put it on there, and they, uh, and they say, okay, let's get ready to go, and they start cutting out the heart. They take out the old heart, and they put it right on the same table, and the old heart is still beating, okay? And then they take the, the cool heart, the new heart, and they start putting it in there, wiggling around a little bit. And they start doing it. In the meantime, I'm looking at the, at the uh, old heart, still beating, starting to slow down, but still beating. And they're doing it, I'm looking over, still beating. Finally, just as they release the clamps and they start putting blood into the new heart, without any paddles, it started to beat. And you gotta believe me, the very moment that started to beat, the old one stopped. It was as if life had gone from the old one to the new one. At that point, I turned around to the guy that was asking me the question, and I said, and, would, and when golf is as exciting as that, maybe I'll take <laughs> up golf. That's a, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a, it's a true story. It's just, you know, and that's, and that's my work, and that's my life. Absolutely. Um, I have to ask, though, just sticking back into what happened at Kipps Bay, I mean, when you had to pull the plug on, that, on the eMesh one trial after six months, I mean, what, can you tell me what went into the decision-making there? I mean, you, you fought hard for the, that trial. That trial got postponed. You know, it took a long time to get that off the ground. And then at six months, you said, no more. I mean, was it like a question that we just have to cut bait, or did you what, did you think about pushing through more? Well, the, the the question we all sat down. I mean, obviously, there's a board of directors working with me. Good guys, really good guys. 
I've always been blessed, honestly, I have to tell you, I've always been blessed with very good boards and people around me. We sat down and we said, you know, we, we had some failures because we had, when we looked at it later on, we, we found out the reason why we had some initial failures. And, uh, and we said, you realize that these failures will now cause us to do, we have to do more implants and all that so that the numbers finally blend in. And that was going to cost us another 10 to $15 million in another year to 18 months. And, uh, and then one board member said, yeah, and in addition to that, guys, you got to remember that if this is successful, and we can make it successful, we then have to do a pivotal, which is about a 30, 35, which we will not be able to raise that kind of money because our stock price is so far down. Maybe some strategic will take us out, you know. I said, it's just too much risk for everybody. So we made a decision to, to shut it down. You know, when we, de when we developed the pacemaker and when we developed the heart valve, come on, a pacemaker, every surgeon in the world knows how to implant a pacemaker. By the way, when, when I did the pacemaker, it was surgeons, not cardiologists doing this, okay? That's ancient history, okay? And we did a heart valve. We did the St. Jude valve. Everybody knew how to implant a valve. It was a few little changes, but not much. But with this device, we had to teach doctors not only how to sew it in, but then very, very critical patient selection, okay? One doctor said to me uh, from Lenox Hill, a very prominent physician, he said, Manny, this product will work it will be used as standard of care. Okay, thank you. And he said, but the, if we do the same kind of patient selection that we do right now, you know, you'll have the same amount of failures as you're seeing right now. But it will be accepted because we do see those kinds of failure. But when you're doing a clinical trial, the FDA doesn't want to see any failures. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they make it really, really tight. And uh, our goal initially was to be have the same rate of failures or accept, I shouldn't say failures, let's, let's reverse that, the same amount of, the same percentage of success as standard of care, and the FDA wanted a higher number of success. Uh, they put it higher for us, and, uh, and that was a really tough bar to, yeah. to, to, to meet. We had to go from a 75% from a success rate to a 90% success rate. That was hard. And I imagine they're all hard, these companies, but I mean, was there a single moment where you said, well, this is gonna be harder than I thought? Was it when, was it, did it, was it back in 09 when you had to no, no, no. pivot on your we, fundraising? No, 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 when we did all our companies, we always had bumps on the road. Yeah. We always had, um, <laughs> I mean, I could tell you one for CPI, I can tell you a bunch for St. Jude and ATS and a whole bunch of other things that we had. I mean, I'm sitting at a table uh, that's sponsored by St. Jude. Um, nice people, great people, great, everybody's working, good jobs and everything. But very few people at that table, if any, know that at one moment the FDA came and were closing down St. Jude. Hmm. They were closing down, we had no failures, we had no, nothing, nothing bad, but they said that we were not following the rules, and we were following the rules, and they wanted to shut us down. And fortunately, the inspector went to see the doctors to get data on us so he could shut us down. And the first doctor he visited was in Washington, state of Washington, Dr. Savage. And Savage said, what are you talking about? These guys are the best guys. They have the best valve. Leave them alone, okay? And the, the same inspector, because he was going down a list, he said, I'm going to go to the people I know. So he first went to Savage. Then he went to another guy named Randy Furlick in Nebraska. Randy Furlick wore boots. And he actually wore a cowboy revolver, a, what do you call it, a six-shooter, okay, with a pearl handle, the whole ball of wax, right out of a cowboy movie. Okay, but he wore it all the time. All right, so the guy walks into his office, he's got his white, white lab coat, you know, doctor's coat on. He sits down and he says, what do you want? You know, and the guy says, well, we're going to shut down St. Jude and all that. Randy right? says, what are you talking about? These are the best guys and all that. Takes out his gun, <laughs> puts it on the table. Didn't point it or anything, just put it on the table. He says, you leave those guys alone. Picked up the, the, uh, the telephone and says, I'm calling the senator. This is when FDA ruling on devices just started. 
you know. So he picked up. I said, I think I'm going to call the senator. The guy left the office, and that was. And then he went back, and I says, you know, we we got to find a different way of doing this. <laughs> so this is not a viable regulatory strategy. <laughs> it worked. Oh, it worked. Well, all right. Okay. <laughs> but that, but, that, but you know that brings up the point about the other thing, you know, again in that final box on the bottom that you guys were talking about doing a new company, is the strategies for regulatory. We have a lot of regulatory people here. I'm sure. I'm absolutely sure, okay, is that as a manufacturer of particularly class three devices, we have to come up with a different way of getting through the regulatory path. Because the present way that we're doing now is a small company raises some money, gets some money, you know, million, five million, ten million, whatever amount of money, that kind of seed capital or whatever, and then they go and spend it, a good major part of it, on regulations. You gotta do it different. I, I know that my next company will be different. I mean, will it still be a class three device? Or, do you, or are you talking about No, class three devices. No, no, I can't change the classes. But no, I mean, are you gonna do a different type of device? I mean. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Did, you, did I ever do any non-class three device? Uh, no. I don't believe so, no. No, I don't think so, no. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like Mickey Man. I'm gonna go for the bleachers every time, okay? <laughs> You told me, you told us last year, Kips Bay was some of the most important work of your life. Yeah, That's it was. A, it was great. And it's named after your, the child, the, uh, the, the rec yes. center that the you, boys club. the boys club that you said changed your life. Yeah. E emotionally, how hard has this been? Well, you know, doing it, you, you know, you do, you, you work hard and every day is an exciting day because you come home and, you know, maybe you have the Cleveland Clinic or the. Texas Heart or Mayo Clinic, you know, in planting, and you're doing work overseas. It's fun. I mean, it's really, really exciting, emotionally fun, and all that. And you're sitting down with a surgeon and says, "Okay, Manny, we we saw this and that, and you back and forth." And it's great work, okay. Uh, and obviously, the greater the work, if you fail, the greater the downturn on you. You know, the the uh, the spiritual and emotional pain, but. It's the people who have told me, Manny, you've tried your best. Don't get hung up on it. Ray was saying to me, I'm walking today, and he says, how do you do it, Manny? You, you look sharp, you look neat, you look, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's basically because, yes, we've, the company closed, but not because we have failed in our work. Our work was good, okay? We're proud of our work. We accomplished things. Don't be a bit surprised if you ever see it again, okay? Because there's just, there's 600 patients out there that's working. I looked at six and seven year angiograms. Whoever sees a six year angiogram? I bet you've never seen a six year angiogram. We had six and seven year angiograms and they were perfect. Okay, so we know that it works. How we get it done through the regulatory is another challenge, which right now I'm not prepared to do. Yeah, but you'll be back. You told me you, have, okay. you, told me you have to get out of here because you have a meeting. Yeah, because um, you'll yeah, be I back. got five more minutes. Unless you want to throw me out now. <laughs> is that what you're trying to tell me, Brian? Is that what you, how well, often do you get up, to, get up to give a talk, and the guy says you? But you know, you have to leave for another minute. <laughs> is, no, you is, held is my arm behind my back to make sure you were ready. No, I want to know what's next, but I know you don't. I don't know you don't want to. You're obviously not going to divulge, but I mean, you're, you'll be back. Oh yeah, I'm not. I'm not ready to retire. Uh, no. I'm happy about it, and my wife is even more happy than I am <laughs> about that. <laughs> Uh, no, I, 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 I love what I do. I, I think I, I still have the energy. I think the brain is still working. What's, what's your name again? <laughs> okay. I think the brain is still working. Uh, it is. I'm, I'm excited in teaching. I was just talking to Ray about uh, a commencement address that I just gave at the, at the University of Iowa uh, in which just telling, telling the, the young people coming out of there that you have no excuse for failure. If you continue to do your work and do it right, you will not fail. You have too many people to support you. It's the same thing with me. The work that we're doing, believe me, we don't do it alone. It's just not Manny Villafana. It's the doctors, the scientists that I have, the, the, my, my staff, my board of directors, everybody behind me doing work, and we don't have any excuse for failure, okay? Uh, I'm not up here saying we got an excuse because of the FDA or anything like that. It's just a matter of life and, and uh, circumstances prevented us from having enough money. We will be back. 
if, if there's a way, if somebody wants to come to me and say, Manny, we'll sponsor you, let's go and get back to it, I'll try. So this technology may see another day? It may see another day. We, we, have, we, we have sold the, tech, the, the, the patents, the IP on it, okay? Uh, and somebody's gonna pick it up. Will they carry it forward? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that's their business, not mine. And we'll see what happens. Well, I, I, I look forward to seeing what happens. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm going to the, uh, I've been asked to attend the, the AdMed uh, 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 conference here in Minneapolis. And the, the deal was that uh, I make a presentation and uh, Ray gets, uh, I get Ray seats at Manny's Steakhouse. <laughs> okay. Now, if you want to go, Ray, Ray made a big <laughs> enough reservation, he'll take all of you, okay? <laughs> you want the whole restaurant that night? We'll talk <laughs> offline on that. Okay, write me a check. <laughs> <laughs> Manny, I, I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time to come out here. I think, honestly, it's, this is a, a really a refreshing moment to, to just hear from you about Kip Spay and what's coming next, and I just, Thank you for, for having the courage to come out here and talk about it. Oh, I very hey, much appreciate it. Let's all give him a great round of applause. It's a lot of guts. I want to say Thanks one more word. I want to say one more word. I, I want to um, apologize to Maria Johnson, Dr. Johnson, who will be giving her presentation. She was supposed to give the presentation at this time, and I, I said to Brian, I said, Brian, I, I really have to get out because I'm going right now to a meeting our very first meeting of our new company, okay? And it happens to be at 8.30 tonight on the other side of town, okay? And Maria says to me, Manny, what am I gonna say now? You, you're up there, I, I was gonna talk about you, and I said, I love Maria. She, she and I have been friends for a long, long time, and I saw her as a, as a young lady coming up and developing an idea. And she has gone through a lot of challenges Okay, so if you, you guys are following companies or you're working to do your own thing, really listen to what she has done. I think she's done a great job. I admire her. Um, and, uh, and she always talked about her husband. And I said, oh, we got to get rid of him because I'm in love with you. You know, and, and you know, but anyway. You better, you so you better run. <laughs> <laughs> I better run. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Real pleasure. Real pleasure. I'll see you. I'll see you next year. Okay. Marie, can I have you come up? Thank you. Hi, Brian. So I, Marie did not want to follow Manny when we first started this, but I'm not worried about that at all. No. <laughs> Can I just say something about Absolutely, Manny myself sure. before we start with the questions? Um, <clears throat> I met Manny about seven years ago. I was working at the university as a faculty member. I had developed this Innovation Fellows program that's still in existence today. And I asked Earl Bakken, or excuse me, not Earl, I was at Earl Bakken's 85th birthday party and I met Bill Hawkins. And I asked him, um, to introduce me to some of the most successful people in medical technology, and Manny was on the top of his list. Yeah. And so I, he has been really instrumental in showing me alternative ways of raising money and putting together pitch decks that describe the product and the clinical need and the solution that you have for that, more than some prescriptive kind of venture model. So I have such a, a yeah. debt of gratitude for him. That's great. It, and Obviously, mentors are so, are so critical. So I, I read an interview you gave a couple of years ago, and you said that uh, you wanted to change the world, which is great, and you hear it a lot. But I, I, I believe it when I hear it from you rather than when I hear it from somebody developing a, an app or a, you know, Tinder for healthcare. Um, but <laughs> let, let's talk about the mission behind Ohm Cardiovascular and the people you brought on to accomplish that mission. Why do you believe you're changing the world? So Brian, I, um, I'm gonna start by pointing out my team so you guys can raise your hand. Raise your hands, thanks. I brought eight people tonight. Brian gave us free tickets. Um, so every person on the team is dedicated to the eradication of needless death due to coronary artery disease. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, there are 1.1 million people who die from coronary disease every single year. It can be electrical or plumbing. We're dealing with the plumbing right now. 100% um, um, of our meetings and of everything that we do is dedicated to that purpose. We celebrate um, when patients' lives are saved, no matter if it's through our clinical study or if it's through our now commercial device in Germany. And uh, I'm so happy to have the most talented people, um, I think, in the area working for me. So you're an accidental entrepreneur. 13 years ago, you were the mother of two very young children. They're both here tonight, which is great. They're not so young anymore. And uh, you were working at, at 3M on a computerized death scope at the time. When we go back there, what were your ambitions at the time, and was being the CEO of a medical device company anywhere on your bucket list? Sure. So I had, um, I was actually at the University of Minnesota working on my master's degree, and as you mentioned, I had um, young children. Um, and the first part of your question is, what were my goals? Yeah. What, I mean, what, what was, what would you think your career would be at that point? Was it a, in the re, in the lab or? Sure, so my primary goal was to make sure that I had um, well-adjusted children that would be happy, really. Um, my second goal was to finish my, my degree and then probably go into academia. Um, can I just tell the story? Just go straight into it, Brian, would that be okay? Sure. Okay, I'll just, it's easier for me to monologue, probably. Um, so 13 years ago, I was, as Brian mentioned, working on my PhD, which was to develop a, um, a computerized stethoscope. Clinicians are using the losing the ability to auscultate, which is use a stethoscope to pick out um, pathology, generally heart, heart valve pathology. Um, I, along the way, so I'm an engineer and not an MD, and so I needed to learn how to use a stethoscope. And I uh, collected data from my husband, who was six foot one, about 180 pounds, 41 years old at the time, looked absolutely normal, swam three days a week. And um, I collected data from him, learning how to auscultate. And nine months after I started my project, he died from a sudden cardiac event. My daughter was four, she's 17 now. My son was uh, seven weeks old at the time. And at that point, I knew that I was gonna do something to stop this terrible disease and sudden, car sudden, sudden cardiac arrest. I mean, you, you're saying you knew at that moment? I knew right then, okay. exactly. Now he was, by all intents and purposes, a very healthy man. He okay. said 6'1", 180, I wish I was that. Um, and you use him as a test case for your stethoscope. What, when you were you're doing it, you, you saw him as a health, his heartbeat as a healthy heartbeat. Um, and in fact, when, I mean, did either of you have any clue about coronary artery blockage? I mean, did you, did you know anything about sudden heart attack? I mean, what, what was your knowledge about, about the, the condition? Sure. Not his condition, but just in general. What was your thoughts on that? Sure, so I think all of us know someone who's had a heart attack, right? And um, yes. it's one in three Americans suffer from, from heart disease. And so I think just like everybody in this audience, maybe the people here actually more so because you're in med tech, um, have heard about this. It's just experiencing it personally uh, made it so much more real. Right? And, but in terms of the sudden heart attack, this, <laughs> this one that people don't survive from, I mean, had you heard about it in the news? I mean, was it something that you were looking at in terms of an indication for this, or, or was that not on the radar? No, it wasn't even on the radar. Okay. And your husband, he also, you had him go to a cardiologist, in fact, as well. I did. So when I was pregnant with my son, I started having premonitions that he was going to die. And so my, uh, our general practitioner during a well baby visit, um, I talked to her about these premonitions. And, and also, he had borderline cholesterol. And I asked her if, he, if she would prescribe a treadmill stress test, and she did. And it came back normal. And actually, the um, technician said that he was you know, kind of a star, uh, a star patient. Right. And so, um, right, so, so he had the treadmill stress test, was absolutely normal. And so, you know, nine months later, he had a heart attack. Complete surprise. Right. And it turned out that his heart was far more damaged than, 
than anyone anticipated, right? I mean, there was, you said there was 90% blockage in three, uh, three areas of the heart? Sure, so I, I'll just kind of frame this for you even more. I, um, uh, after my husband died, I had to make the decision on whether or not I was gonna get a job or finish my PhD. And so I decided I was just gonna suck it up and finish my PhD. And after a period of about three months of grieving, I went in to meet with my faculty advisor who was a cardiologist working in the echo lab. And, and I, I know that he was expecting this, okay, but we talked about the project and how to get reengaged. And I pulled out the autopsy report and I said, tell me what happened. And he took his hand just like this, guys, and looked down and explained to me that he had died from a vulnerable plaque that ruptured in his LAD, his Widowmaker artery, and um, had severe blockage 90 to 99% in the rest of his major coronary vessels. Uh, at the end of this discussion with his hand like this, I asked him, if you had known that it was there, could you have done anything to fix it? And he said, yes. And I knew right then that the work I was doing on my stethoscope, the data I had collected from my husband, and the alignment of having all this information together was by the hand of God that I was supposed to do something about it. And so that's what I've been doing. I'm set off to do it. And it was at that moment where you, in your sort of sleepless nights, started digging into the data, looking for this sign, right? This, yeah. this sound. And, and what, did you know what sound you were looking for at that time or? or? Absolutely not. So the field of data mining was pretty new then. I um, changed my minor in my PhD program to statistics and started to employ um, a variety of statistical techniques, so vectorization, matrix algebra, and things that probably a lot of you are, have heard before, armor methods. And um, you know, I twisted and turned this data every way that I could. And I remember the night um, where I found the signature the, the frequency signature associated with coronary disease. The house was dark, the kids were in bed, and I had my computer screen on, I was working. And I did a frequency plot, and I saw the frequencies in uh, the 50 to 100 hertz region, and I heard a voice that said, there it is. And um, I knew I had it then, yeah. at least a portion of it, Brian. And then what I did was I dug into the clinical literature, I'm a scientist, and I discovered that in 1967, a guy named Doc, D-O-C-K, described, he had a case study where he described a, um, a, a guy, 49-year-old guy, who had a moderate to severe stenosis in his Widowmaker artery and um, consequent um, moderate to severe murmur found at his second left and third left intercostal space on the parasternal border. And I knew that we had it. And from there, so I always say that um, I found it by accident, but it's always been there. And so I found the single case study, but then I also found a number of other case studies by other clinicians that are in peer-reviewed journals describing the same phenomena. Right. Interestingly, there are, uh, there's a group from Rutgers and Dartmouth who did a lot of engineering work on the same phenomena in the 80s and early 90s. They, they reported really terrific results. They, they really never translated it into a usable clinical device. It wasn't until I wrote uh, an abstract for circulation describing the use of a stethoscope. That's where we started, right? That's our humble beginnings. We are no longer a stethoscope, okay? Um, but um, the field is really moving forward now. And I'm thinking back to that moment where the doctor puts his head on his hands, and I'm thinking about what that must feel like for the family. And you've talked, you must have talked to hundreds of people now who have experienced the same feeling that you've felt. I mean, emotionally, you've already been kicked as hard as you can get, but then when you find out you could have prevented that, is that insult to injury? I mean, what, does that, where does that put you in, in, in your... Sure, so I think you think it's really unfair. It shouldn't be that way. Right. And your life is turned upside down. I don't know a single widow or widower who would look at it and say, yeah, I expected something like this to happen to me. It's a complete shock. Yeah. So when you're there and you're data mining all night, I mean, in, in your, 
what's what's motivating you at that at, at those moments? I mean, is it is it is it really societal? I have to stop this. Are you coping with your own grief at that time? I mean, is there something that you're trying to achieve beyond? I need to change the world. Okay. So I've been interviewed a number of times, and Brian asked me this question before, and I said that's the first time anyone's ever asked me that question. And so I look at that little girl there and that boy right there, and I was trying to make sense of their father's death. And have you? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. So we take this discovery, and, and you're, you're essentially, to dumb it down for me, uh, you're learning, you, you, and you now understand the sound of the blood flow mm -hmm. through, and, and a healthy flow just sounds like water rushing. Mm -hmm. You said an unhealthy flow sounds like water flowing over rocks. Yes. Okay. So you have that, you've found that. Now, at, at that moment, are you saying, I'm going to build a company? Or are you saying, this is, you know, I've, I've found this algorithm or I found this, this something. I'm just going to sell it to a company or I'm going to give it to somebody. I mean, where you, you, you have that answer that you were looking for. Now, what happens? Sure. So I should just start by saying I, um, I worked for General Motors for 12 years. I was a fourth generation GM employee. I was a manufacturing engineer, and I thought I would do that my whole life. Went into academia and um, you know, started inventing things. So I have in inventions in um, uh, hip replacements, fetal monitoring, stroke, atrial fibrillation. And um, I, I, I didn't even know how to say the word entrepreneur and kind of make fun of myself. I was talking to my daughter, and I said, it's entrepreneur. I mean, it wasn't until I actually became one that I, that I learned how to say it. Um, right. So um, what happened was I discovered this frequency and a way to process it and disclosed it to the University of Minnesota where I was doing a postdoc. And um, they, the tech transfer office has a website, right? And they put all their inventions on it and they look for entrepreneurs to, to take the device forward and build companies. And so they patented it, put it out on the website and nobody could see the vision, right? Because it was math. Okay, right. and um, it sat there for a few years, and I did a postdoc out at Stanford with the folks at Biodesign, and they, I had no idea this was honestly um, an accident because I thought the program was focused on something other than translational science, but I thought they're not doing anything. I'm gonna ask them to give me the patents back because the university had the rights, and they did. Free and clear, they gave, okay. gave them back, and I, um, I said, well, I have it, <laughs> better do something now. And so I kind of um, didn't do much for a long time, a few years. I, mean, I was talking to my husband, um, who is sitting there and is very supportive and has been incredible throughout this venture. But um, we used to make models in the basement of our house in Farmington, and he was a, um, like a, a professional jet ski or something. And so he was really good with decals. And so we would put decals on these little, you know, Crayola uh, uh, ceramic models and stuff. So that's, you know, it was kind of like walking around it, not really deliberate. And it wasn't until I won a qualifying therapeutic delivery project grant. Do any of you remember this? And there are lots of people in here that have probably gotten that grant. But um, the Obama administration put out a call for grants in July of, I think, 2010. It was a very simple application. I filled it out, and within about Three months, the government gave us $250,000. Now I was working, I was leading a think tank at the university, and I thought, well, the only way to spend this money responsibly is to leave the university. And um, my turning point, and this is going to be very amusing to you probably, was for this grant I had to set up a business account. So we had uh, an LLC for a long time, which probably most of you know is really nice. It's a pass-through entity, but um, I. Um, went to the bank and I met with a small business banker and we set up this account and the guy said to me, do you want a credit card yeah. and checks? And I said, why would I need a credit card and checks, right? <laughs> well, and um, money, right? I got the credit card and the checks in the mail and all of a sudden it was a real business to me. It, I, it, there was something about that whole, <laughs> and uh, my husband acted as the um, accountant and chief financial officer before my <laughs> So even when you're starting this, you don't think it's a, no. a business? No. 
again, what's pushing you at this moment? I mean, you just, did you just, you just couldn't stand to see that technology sitting there doing nothing? So I think- Or that answer doing nothing? Yeah, so, so I think at that point, um, you know, I had, it, it still wasn't deliberate, Brian, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. I had this chunk of money, I sort of had a vision about how we should spend it. I knew I wanted to get this product on the market and I just started moving forward. And um, I, I, of course, I live and breathe this mission. I mean, this is everything mm -hmm. to me, and I think it's the purpose and meaning of my life at this point. And if I die with this product on the market, I'll die, you know, having done something. And, and you do, in fact, have it on the market in Germany. We do. We are selling. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We love money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here you are. You're an accidental entrepreneur. And you're raising money now. I mean, and, mm -hmm. and did you go and you went out and raised money from venture capitalists? Did you uh, know? No, no, no way. So I, um, as I mentioned before, Manny was pretty instrumental in um, my starting the company, and he gave me a lot of really great advice. And when I was out at Stanford, they always suggested the the venture capital model, right? You develop a pitch deck, and the pitch deck has clinical need, and you go into reimbursement, regulatory. And um, Manny said, you know. You can just use a PPM. And he gave me his PPM from Kips Bay and said, read it. And so I looked it over. And uh, just for those of you who don't know, that's a private placement memo. And it's a way to raise money from private individuals. And so I uh, unbelievably have some incredible um, high network um, individuals who have financed me to this point. I've raised about 10.3 million using that method. And I've had a lot of people say, wow, you've gotten really far on that amount of money. And you can really ask anybody on my staff about spending money. They fill out purchase orders, and they do this. They throw them on my desk and run away, right? right. Nervous about my signing it, and that's the honest to God truth. You can ask any of them. So 10.3 million from high net worth individuals. Yes. No yep. venture capitalists. No. What, I mean, is it, what do you think makes them write the check? Right. What have they told you makes them write the check? Is it? The, the impact they say they can have, or are they just drawn to this mission in this story? So I think that um, for the first month that any of the people um, that are on my team work for me, they're still pretty enamored with the story. And then the reality of what we're trying to do kind of hits them, and it's a lot of hard work, okay? Same thing with the high net worth individuals. They don't give you money because they're in love with the story, okay? Um, they, they fund this company and this mission because one third of all Americans suffer from heart disease. We all know somebody that has had a heart attack, someone that's died from it or lives with it currently. Their friends suffer from this. And so they see that we can detect obstructive coronary disease in about 20 minutes. And that's taking the data to receiving the report back. We, we do it quickly, we do it non-invasively. I mean, it's a, a, actually a relaxing test. It takes only eight minutes for us to collect the, the data. The patient's laying on the back in supine position. Right. No pharmaceuticals. It's, um, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, no, it's great. I, 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 when I went and interviewed Maria, I, I asked her if they could do it for me so that I could have some peace of mind. And it was, uh, it was very quick and easy, and it was terrific. And uh, I promise I haven't been binging on bacon ever since. Yeah. So I've been trying to be really good. But it, I mean, the peace of mind is incredible. I mean, because yeah. um, I mean, this is a terrifying condition. I mean, I, I think back when Tim Russert uh, passed away from his sudden, car, sudden heart attack. And one of the things that we, that the newspapers wrote was that, you know, it's just a reminder that a visit to the doctor is not a bulletproof vest. And, and, and that even, in the in the best of cardiology, that still there's still this level of medicine that's a guess, and and you know I wonder if that as a scientist to you, you know, that must still seem very shallow. I mean that that we're still at a point of a guess. I would agree. So I'm an engineer by training, um, and it it this always surprises me. Um, the treadmill stress test, which is really the first test that they will prescribe to determine if you have uh, heart disease is only 67% sensitive, which means that 33% of the time they miss uh, disease in a patient who's sick. 
So you have to let that sink in 33% of the time. On the other side of it, it has a sensitivity about 72%, which means 28% of the time they tell a normal person that they're diseased. So you say, okay, that's a treadmill. Maybe it's not so accurate. But an echocardiogram, a stress echo, which is a myocardial perfusion test, it's 80-80. And so there really are no perfect um, tests for um, um, assessing heart condition. Right. And even another thing I, I read in, a, in, a, in a, an incident like he had, you know, there's only a 5% survival rate in a witnessed heart attack. So, I mean, there's nothing you can do once it starts. Right. And, and so, the people that you're working with, the cardiologists that you're working with, do they believe, um, do they believe in what you're doing or, the, or when you're talking to them for the first time or, it's, or do you find that there's resistance at all to your device? <laughs> So they, um, they usually say it's too good to be true. Um, our uh, FDA pivotal study is a non-inferiority study against nuclear stress test. Nuclear stress test is a $5,000 study. It requires six millisieverts of, um, excuse me, 25 millisieverts of radiation. It's a three to five hour test, and we're saying we're not inferior to them. And I mean, it's basically show me the money, right? They want to see the data, and that is our challenge: is the data. Mm -hmm. We have a 1,000 patient pivotal study. We're 957 patients into it. We're a hair away from finishing that study. So that that's a lot of data, but they want even more data. So we have another 1,000 patient post market study going on in Europe. We have a 100 patient study, um, scientific-based study, going on here in, in St. Paul, but then also in Washington, D.C. So we are all about the clinical proof. We want to show people that it works, because it does seem unbelievable. So it's a $5,000 test. Well, how much does, does this test cost, the cadence so, test? Yeah, so cadence is $100. So that's a that's pretty dramatic savings right there. Yeah. And... I'm wondering, now that you've been at this for a while, you founded the company, you said 2009, so we're 09, 10, mm -hmm. so we're five years in. I mean, what, what do you would say, uh, first of all, is the thing that you're, mo you're proudest about with this device that you've developed and the company you've built? So this will seem shocking, but I'm um, proud of myself for getting FDA agreement on our pivotal study. That was hard, and it required a lot of patience and time. And do you feel like you've made some mistakes along the way? <laughs> Would you share any of them Would you, for the group? <laughs> Where do I start? Um, <laughs> oh, they always say that. Come on. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll say one more thing I'm proud of. We, you know, we launched in an outbuilding on my property. We are uh, right now in the rear of an old kitchen concept store between McDonald's and an auto zone. That's right. Um, it's in the rear, right? <laughs> and um, we never bought furniture, really good furniture. Um, we, I didn't hire a lot of people up front. I mean, we're really lean. I do have to say, we are moving to the big leagues. We yeah. are moving into a new building on Monday, but I'm very proud of the fact that we, we didn't spend money in, um, in, in uh, ways other than in clinical or in engineering. But... Go ahead. And it's a, no, no, it's a big, you're moving into a much bigger spot, right? 3,800 square feet? Yes, say? it's lovely. So there's, it's not going to have that same, because I remember going to your office and the front door, there was like, I couldn't find the front door and it looked like uh, there was furniture <laughs> blocking the front door. There are. Uh, so we have two garage doors instead of one yeah. and they open. Yeah. Are you worried at all about leaving that sort of, this, you know, uh, scrappy, startup y kind of place? And, get into the big leagues, you know, maybe you'll have to, you know, become a real big league CEO or anything. <laughs> anything were you, were you about that? We have two garage doors and a bar, a small barbecue out back. I think we're a little, <laughs> little ways away from that. I mean, as you change, as you grow this company, are you going to, are you going to change at all? You think? Personally, personally change. As a, as a, as a CEO, as a businesswoman. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I, it's pretty, tiring to do a job like this. And so I'm learning more and more how to let other people 
take the work on and um, make the jobs theirs instead of me constantly being involved in everything. Mm -hmm. And um, I try to hire the best people that I can. And um, uh, so I just have to trust that everything's going to be okay. Right. And you're going to be scaling up, or you're going to be hiring as well. Yes. So you're um, going to go from about how big to how big? So I started at, um, started with myself, and then I added that young man. Um, he was my second employee. He was an intern for a really long time, and that, he worked hard, <laughs> okay? He was like, used to book travel for me in the old days, and now he's a project manager, and absolutely magnificent in that role. So it was two for a couple years, and now we're at 10 full time, and I've got about five consultants. And over the years, I've had, um, lots of people that have worked with me on these projects and um, it, it's only because of those people that we are where we are so the goal is to ramp up of course but to do it in a way that makes sense right. and you're on the market in germany mm -hmm. and that was that was recent right you got the ce mark there we did okay and any surprises about commercialization that you were Yes, so um, I have a wonderful board of directors and um, they suggested that we get our CE mark because our FDA clinical, style, clinical trial was taking years and so they felt that it would be important for the company um, to keep the momentum. And so um, I, I really believe that most people do not realize how hard it is to launch in um, uh, the EU. I mean, it's an eight hour trip there and we're there all of the time. I have a very lean staff and language is an issue, even though everybody says that the Europeans speak English. I have a guy who speaks German on my staff and um, it really makes a difference and it's hard. It's hard. And yeah. we're not using distributors at this point. You're selling direct. And then we are selling direct. You anticipate, I mean, you can never anticipate the FDA, but we're going to be on the market in the U.S. at, at some point. In 2017, yeah. And we'll be changing lives then as well. Mm. well. Thank you so much. I wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Brad. This is a great mission. Because as you thank told you. me, God doesn't want us to die, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. So again, I apologize for running a tad bit behind. And as we bring our next panel up, uh, I did want to take a moment. Um, so Martha and Bob, where are they? Okay, they're coming up. I'm gonna, I'll kill time. Um, so Mass Device was founded in 2009, and earlier this year, uh, after six years of working really hard, um, we were approached by a company called WTWH Media to merge with them and to expand the vision. One of the things we did, and, and we did say yes, uh, one of the things we did was launch this new magazine, this new publication called Medical Design and Outsourcing. And one of the great pleasures we've gotten is that we have a chance to relaunch our Big 100 list. And the Big 100 list is a list of the top 100 medical device companies. And what we wanted to do, uh, we do have some stuff uh, for the companies that came tonight, but I wanted to take a moment just to recognize the companies that were in the room and then after the show, I'm going to have you come up. We're going to take a picture. And we're going to hand out this, this bling because you know, it's, it's, it's good stuff. But uh, first of all, from our list, uh, from Minnesota, and these are just our Minnesota list, and their representatives are in the room, so maybe you could stand up when I call you. I won't call your name. I'm just going to call your company. Uh, Smith's Medical, Boston Scientific, uh, a company called Medtronic, and St. Jude. So everybody from those companies, stand up for a second. I know you got to get the blood pumping. Thank you for coming. These are, the, these are the pillars of the community, and then we have several companies that we call ones to watch. And the one of, the, of those companies that are in the room, Ohm Cardiovascular, of course, is on that list. Rotation Medical is on that list. Sunshine Heart and Intellis Medical. And we are lucky enough to have with us two representatives from there, Bob White, the CEO of Intellis Medical, and Martha Shaden from Rotation Medical. I apologize, Dave Rosa called me this morning at 4 a.m. He emailed me. Unfortunately, he's having some, some, some pretty bad back issues. So rather than have him come sit on a couch, uh, I thought we'd give him a reprieve. But I'm gonna hand this panel over to Shay Mandel from Life Science Alley, and he's gonna take us home. And then afterwards, my big 100s and my ones to watch, we're all on stage, we're doing a group shot, and 
you definitely want these paperweights. They're, they're killer. So thank you so much. Good evening. Uh, before we get started, I, you know, it's always fun to bring Brian to Minnesota. It's fun to Raz, and you know, I think our what we'll do at AdvaMed next year here certainly will exceed Boston. So we'll continue that rivalry. But sincerely, <laughs> uh, you know, Brian has been a tremendous partner for Life Science Alley, and I think for this community uh, over the past couple of years, you know, we've really been in pursuit of trying to elevate the expertise of this community is that epicenter of global health technology leadership. And so when Brian sits up and says, well, let's recognize the local companies from Smith and Smith's and Medtronic and St. Jude and TELUS rotation, I, mean, I think we've got that mantle. I think we've earned it. And so part of our organization's responsibility is to do a better job of telling that story. And Brian has been a tremendous partner. So all kidding aside, I'd like to ask everybody uh, to give Brian and Mass device, a round of applause for making Minnesota one of our key <laughs> And so with that, and starting 30 minutes late, um, it's really an honor, of course, to have Bob and Martha with us tonight. Um, I'm going to let them tell a little bit, uh, just quick background on their story, and then we're going to talk about the topics that, that Manny talked about, that Marie talked about. You know, how you get a company moving forward in this environment, talk about funding and IPOs versus venture raising and strategy. Um, and you're going to hear from two of the great experts. I love these two mostly because their products are the products at this point in my life that I need the most. And every time I see Martha, she's trying to sell me on finally getting that rotator cuff fix. So um, Martha, why don't we start with you and then Bob. Take a couple minutes, please. I think everybody here knows both of you and your companies, but just set the table for what we're going to talk about. Tell us a little bit about your companies. Okay. So I'm Martha Shaden um, from Massachusetts, by the way, so go Pats. Um, and um, I'm the CEO of Rotation Medical. Rotation Medical is a very novel device for uh, healing rotator cuff tears. So I suspect if I asked you in this room, who knows someone who has a rotator cuff tear or suffers from it themselves, um, there probably wouldn't be too many people who wouldn't raise their hands. It's a very prevalent disease. Um, and we recently commercialized our product. Uh, prior to joining Rotation Medical, I ran the trauma business for Zimmer. And prior to that, um, I ran the biosurgery business for Covidian, which is now part of Medtronic. And thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel. Great. Thanks, Martha. Bob, please. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, good evening, everybody. I appreciate the invitation. Um, so I run Intellis Medical, and uh, I think very much like Martha, uh, good or bad, there's a lot of folks in this room who probably could raise their hand and say they have uh, chronic sinusitis or have at least experienced that sometime during their lives. Uh, that's our focus. Uh, the company makes minimally invasive therapies to be able to go in and open up the sinus passageways to um, cure those folks um, long term. And uh, we've been in the market now for about five years. We just fast passed our 100,000th patient, so we've done quite a few procedures. And back in January, we decided to go public, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, so it's been a fun ride for the company, for the team. I'm, I'm privileged to have a few members of my team over there. I won't ask them to stand up, but and I'm sure we'll talk more about them later. But we got a, a stellar team out in Plymouth who have really done a fantastic job with this business over the years. Uh, before Intellis Medical, I actually had um, been CEO of a company called Tyrex for uh, about four years, and it was an infection control business. Medtronic acquired us um, about a year and a half ago now. It seems like time flies. And that's when I made the step over to Intellis. And then before that, and not in any way connected, but coincidental, was I did work at Medtronic for about eight years and did a variety of things, including running some of their businesses for them. So I've been in the medical device industry for too long now, but it's been great. And uh, I'd like to look forward to continuing it, although probably not as long as Manny <laughs> continues to go. Yeah, so. clearly it's never too long, right? <laughs> so, um, well, you know, both Marie and Manny, I mean, there, there are a lot of different ways uh, to build a company, uh, to make it successful, to go through the hardships. Uh, but one thing that's constant is you need capital, and you need capital uh, to fund people, research, to move your products forward. So, you know, Bob, you mentioned you guys have recently gone public. 
Martha, you guys have had a really successful run with, with I'll call it traditional venture capital, although I'm not sure that that's really even in existence anymore, certainly in, in our industry space. So for you, for both of you, you know, share with the audience a little bit about um, you know, what your strategy was to use that vehicle, um, kind of how you got there, and how you know, being either on the public markets or, or you know, going through a Series B round, Martha, as you did, how that changes and shapes the strategy of your company, whether it's prospectively for to be an acquisition target uh, or continue to move forward. So, Bob, why don't you go ahead and tell us about your IPO? Uh, sounds great. So, you know, the question comes up a lot. I mean, I guess the good news is for the med tech industry for the last two years or so, the doors have finally reopened on the IPO side. And as we all know in this room, it took a long time for us to get there. Uh, so as opposed to my last business, Tyrex, we really didn't have the option. It was, uh, it was pretty much strategic exit or just continue to privately fund until you're profitable. <clears throat> but in the case of Intellos, when we uh, sort of went through the assessment last summer, uh, there were really a couple of reasons. I mean, at the end reason, the real reason is return on the investment. When they looked at the market, when we looked at the market from a board standpoint and looked at the potential returns you could garner, given that there had been some good peer companies that had gone out the door, it looked like the returns would probably be, be, be better than if you went out and did a strategic exit. So that was really, I mean, the, the crux of it. Uh, but that said, there were some other factors. You know, a big part of it is how sustainable is your business model? Can you take it to a much more significant level? We were doing last year through the roadshow, or through uh, 2014 when we went into our roadshow, about $50 million in revenues. And that was sort of the sweet spot, you know, back then for what public companies needed to be able to demonstrate combined with solid growth in the top line. And so it just sort of hit that spot where if you were able to do that, go public, the returns were likely going to be better for, for investors. Um, but from a sustainability standpoint, we looked not only at our core business and how much more could we penetrate the market, uh, but also how could we evolve our model to be more than just simply a chronic sinus company focused on middle invasive technologies. So, so our simple story today, and I like to think it is simple, is that the, the big sort of um, orientation of Intellis is taking a lot of cost out of the healthcare system by moving patients from the operating theater into the office environment. And so not a lot different than ophthalmology and, and, and other practices where you've seen that. We can take 50% uh, basically of the healthcare spend out of the healthcare system, and that's a strong story. But in addition to treating chronic sinusitis, our view is we can do a whole bunch of other things in the ENT world as well. So this year, that's what we're focused on. So we're building the chronic sinusitis business. Now that we've become public, our story is expanding to basically other technologies to facilitate the migration of patients out of the more expensive operating room setting and into the office setting. So it's exciting. And, and I guess the last thing I would say, too, is that it takes a team. So a big part of this in becoming a public company is different in a lot of respects. You have to look around the table and see what kind of team do you have and can the team get it done. Not that that might prevent you, but it certainly would require a lot of change, and sometimes that change can't always be good. So, you know, we, we are again fortunate to have a very strong team around the table, many of whom had been in large organizations as well as in small and understood the differences. And so with those three pieces sort of falling into place, we took the plunge, and here we are today. So. About yeah, so we were at a little different stage. When we uh, went out to raise money last, last year, um, first of all, we all know how difficult it is to raise money for med tech. There are some categories within med tech that are more attractive than others. We happen to be in the orthopedic space. So um, you know, it took us probably nine to 10 months to, to raise the money. And at the end of the day, we were oversubscribed and we were able to raise 27 million. Um, it is not easy. I think that if you have a good technology and if the technology is answering a very clear, articulated, unmet need, and if you have good data and you have a really strong management team, there is money. There's a lot of money out there. Um, and the FDA is not the problem right now. You know, I think that large, they've made a lot of, lot of gains here and their, their rate of getting decisions made are much faster. It's really the reimbursement that was our, you know, uh, the, the thing that was the most difficult for us is telling the story and convincing investors that they would get, that 
they would get paid for the device. Um, I think that I spoke to over 65 VCs and heard a lot of no's. And um, it just took a couple of VCs to believe in the story, but I think that at the end of the day, there is money, and, and what we learned through that is you just have to you know, listen to the questions that are being asked, go back and redo your pitch, um, so that the next time you've answered some, many of those questions, and you just pound the pavement, and it's not, a, it's not an event, it really is a process, and I think that you have to, you have to expect it's going to take 10, 12 months to, to find the money. But I think you can if the technology is good, there's good data, and there's a strong management team. So before we actually move off this topic, I just want to follow up a little bit on both of your comments. So you know, at Life Science Alley, every day we talk to uh, people like yourselves. And so you know, as Frank Chaskolke likes to say, for years we would hear everybody say kind of what you've just said, Martha. You know, I raised a bunch of money. We were oversubscribed, but nobody else is raising money. Things are really difficult out there. And, and so we've published some reports recently that um, you know, I think demonstrate that there has been a lot more money, at least in, in this particular marketplace, than we thought before. So I'm going to ask you both you know, a little crystal ball you know, for the people in the audience that, that are looking to go down that pathway, or even for the strategics that are looking at uh, the M&A markets. You know, is there really more money out there? And if so, um, is, is sort of that value proposition, because I think both of you really hit on that value proposition, and what does it really take today to capture that money? Uh, and how available is it? Are, are we back in terms of dollars? No, no. I, I, we're not back. I mean, there's, you know, um, there's a fraction of the VCs that uh, today uh, than, than there was five years ago even, right? And of the VCs that are left, um, many of them have pivoted and are now investing more in pharma and bio biotech than they are in med tech. And to make it even worse, if they are investing in med tech, they want a completely de-risk property. You know, they want it, so they want to see some commercial traction. So um, they're not back um, by any means. Um, and, and maybe this is just the natural order of selection. Maybe this is the way it should have always been. Whereas you have to have a product that answers a need, a, you know, an unmet clinical need. And it has to do it either better, cheaper, um, save money somehow, um, make it more convenient for the, the surgeons to, to deliver it. But it, there's got to be a reason why that's going to exist. And I think that it's just crystallizing that for us because the money is so tight um, that, um, that you got to have a really good story. So you, you have to know where the product really fits and is it really differentiated. And Bob, as you guys were going through your roadshow, I mean, mm -hmm. did you find that, I mean, is that cost containment or yep. cheaper, you know, as Martha mentions, is that critical? It's important, yeah, so I think the big three, whether you're looking for private funds or public funds, are is the market big, is it going to take cost out of the healthcare system, and what level of risk does the business model have, you know, looking forward? Whether you're looking for private investors or public, I think that's sort of what they care about. Um, yeah, you know, you do see some models out there where they don't necessarily take cost out of the healthcare system, but there's not a lot of money that are going to follow those opportunities. I think most people have now figured out, in, in large measure, I think, because the strategics have figured that out. And so the companies like Medtronic and like Abbott and whatnot, I, I believe from what you see and how they act, they're looking, you know, at ways in which they can reduce overall spend. In large measure, that's through minimally invasive technologies, but also it's, you know, other ways as well. So to me, those are the three sort of big attributes, and, and we continue to hear that. There's a lot of money lined up, from my standpoint, on models like that. The unfortunate part of that is, as Maria mentioned, you know, there is less money for the higher risk models. You know, anything that's not fully de-risk, like class three medical devices, as Manny spoke about earlier. And that's the unfortunate part, because I do think there's a lot less innovation that will likely occur in the U.S. because of that. 
but you know you take risk out of either of those models, or you certainly move down to lower class devices. There's there's a fair amount of money out there. Hmm. Well, and certainly we know there is a lot of money, you know, changing hands out there through an incredibly active M and A market. And mm -hmm. and if you don't believe it, I, mean, I can show you the number of Life Science Alley members we've lost over the years as a result of acquisition. <laughs> so Medtronic buys Covidian's great, except we lost a member. So although Medtronic's been wonderful about that, as has Boston and 3M and St. Jude that continue to buy our companies. Um, and I think Minnesota's done particularly well yes. uh, in the M&A market. But so both of you, um, you've been on the big corporate side. You've been in the middle of deals. You've evaluated companies. Um, you've bought companies. So I'm curious about you know a couple of pieces of that. So as you evaluated management teams, technologies, pathways. So what about you as the acquirer in your past? What lessons have you learned that you're applying as a CEO in a smaller company? And then as you know, a prospective acquiree, or at least running in the circles of lots of prospective acquirees, which, which is easier? What do you, which is easier? Is it easier to be the pursuer or the pursuee and for, <laughs> For companies that may be the pursuees today, um, what would you tell them they need to be preparing for as they start to sit down with strategics? Yeah, Maria, go ahead, take a shot at the <laughs> Okay, I can't even remember the questions. I don't even that, remember the question. Uh, it's because me, it's 8.30 and. All right, I'll take a stab at it and then, and then Bob, you fill in the blanks. Um, okay, so, um, you know, yes, I had an opportunity on the strategic side to look at a lot of um, small startups, right? And um, there was once in a great while that, a, that a, a, a technology would get our attention and the company would get our attention. Most um, small companies, um, what we would find is this. They had an interesting technology, um, but there was no way to make money on it. So the cost of the device was just unreasonably high, and there wasn't a path to profitability, not one that we could clearly see, right? So that was part of the problem. The other thing, and this shouldn't really matter from a strategic acquisition side, but it does, is how much money was invested in the company? How much money did they have in? And because our assumption was that the investors were looking for a certain multiple, right, to get out. And so we would shy away um, with the assumption that um, we, we couldn't afford them, that, that their expectation for what they would want and what we would pay for were, you know, would be miles apart. Um, you know, the other thing was um, you gotta, you got to look at your go-to-market strategy and your commercialization. And when we saw a very complicated channel, so, um, and you don't, get, you don't get points for your sales organization because, presum you know, presuming that you, you're buying this because there's synergies, and you're going to take it and plop it into your existing channel, right? So what we found was there, there were a lot of companies that built a sales organization that would make it very difficult for us to integrate it in to our selling organization. For instance, distributorships, right? You have to expect that if you're going to take that and you're plopping it into yours, and you're not going to keep those distributors, you are going to take a step back, right? You're going to stall or lose some business while you're building it back up. Um, so those were some of the things that were really, uh, um, seemed to be repeated a lot um, as we looked at um, the companies. And then the reimbursement. The reimbursement um, is probably on the top of the list. Are you going to get paid for it? Um, and um, that, that's a challenge. You know, I think that 
we've come a long way with FDA. I think that CMS is now the issue and that um, what they are doing has very significant unintended consequences for small businesses because the number one reason that I heard no was because they didn't understand or believe that we could get paid for our device. <clears throat> That's a problem. It's not one branch of the federal government. It's, <laughs> it's the one. other. Right. Um, so, Bob, you know, Bob, you looked at a lot of companies. I mean, are, yeah. were there some things you saw not in, in leadership teams or in strategies that, that you really liked that you've kind of put into practice or modeled some of your leadership uh, with Intellis around? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, want to sit up here and have, want to offer a piece of wisdom that nobody's heard before, and there isn't really any. <laughs> Um, you know, it does start with people, right? So if you have a good organization, if you have a good team, whether you're assessing them or whether you're a part of it, that is always a critical differentiator. And mostly because it's the hard times. The easy times, you know, anybody can sort of get it done, even to a degree, but it's when those challenges come up and they do all the time, whether it's reimbursement or whether it's regulatory, whatever it may be, uh, you know, the team's got to be um, intelligent, fast, nimble, all the things you want them to be, and experienced enough to be able to navigate through those waters. So. You know, I think it is, it's about making sure you have really great people around you in order to be able to get the job done. That's the key. Uh, I don't think you asked the question earlier, what's easier? <clears throat> They're all hard. I, I don't know of anything that's been easy, um, you know, in terms of whether you're buying or selling or sort of in the middle. I, I do, you know, one thing that I know we thought about a lot at Tyrex um, was um, where do you focus your energies? Because you only have so much capital, you only have so much time. And we always felt, because of the period of time that company was developing, that there wasn't really going to be an IPO market. So it was really about how do you appeal to the strategics? And we quickly decided, in addition to getting some things done, like getting product approvals, which is pretty important, uh, was also to be able to demonstrate commercial traction. And because we, were developed, we had been selling or marketed a device to help reduce infection rates associated with pacemakers and ICDs, our view is if we can show good penetration into a few accounts without overextending ourselves from a commercial spend standpoint, the big guys can do the math, right? So, you know, if we can get 10, 15 reps to show good solid strength in a few accounts, then we can take that story to the guys who might be interested in a CRM innovator that's differentiating their technology. So that's, that was an example, but it was things like that, thinking about how do you do it in a way you can get it done quickly, efficiently, without over, you know, extending the spend, which would dilute all the investors. Well, you mentioned people, and I do want to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, the healthcare environment seems to be so rapidly changing, yeah. um, more evolving, very complex, uh, whether it's terms like value and the inability to define it, you know, depending on what size your company is, what space, what government agency you're dealing with. Um, so a lot of complexity. We're also seeing a lot of complexity, certainly in the convergence of technologies, digital health around diagnostics and drug device combos. And both of you have, in your backgrounds before these roles, some diversity, some orthopedics, drug devices. So, you know, Part A, you know, how has the diversity of experiences that you've had uh, made you better prepared to deal with what we really none of us can see around the corner tomorrow? And then in building those teams, whether it's management teams, um, you know, or the new hires, you know, fresh out of grad school, are you interested in people with a broader diversity of experiences? Is that, is that in and of itself? a skill of value um, that you see important, especially in a, in a smaller company? Want to go first? I think it's right. Bob's turn. I think it is. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Martha might jump in there. Yeah. Um, well, Martha likes this question. <laughs> yeah. I know, actually. It's a great question. So uh, I guess the, a couple of things. The first is, you know, f having done this for a while, it's pattern recognition is probably the first thing that I think about. Yeah. And the second is a network of folks you know that once you spot a pattern and you know a problem's coming, that you sort of recognize you know who to call and begin to get help. I think those are the two things for me that have personally been useful. You know, and we've all been down the reimbursement paths. You, you sort of know, you, know, you just have a sense of how things are going as you begin to get into those conversations. And hopefully by identifying where you may go, you can, you know, if you can't figure it out or haven't been through it, you can identify some folks to support and help. 
From the standpoint of resources, it's great if there's diversity. You know, of course, generally folks coming up through the organization aren't, aren't that diverse outside of their functional area. But I think that's okay. I think at the senior team level, you certainly want to have folks who've been there, done that enough times, so they can also have sort of the ability to spot patterns and identify resources at their disposal so they can move quickly and help problem solve their way through those things. So th those two attributes, I guess, are sort of what I, I think about. Yeah, yeah I'll answer the question a little bit different way. Um, and I agree with what Bob said a minute ago. I think that my experience, I've had experience with class one, class two, PMA, and drugs, right? And um, so I've seen the whole spectrum. And I think my experience has really helped me understand that it's not a one size fits all. And that when you're developing your strategy, you go to, you know, your commercialization plans, that you really have to understand what, how disruptive that product is and what, what are you really trying to do. So if the end game is to sell to a strategic, what is it that you have to prove? And I think that all too often what we try to do is take our experiences and just translate them to um, that next product, which is not necessarily the right thing to do. So for instance, um, we're in the orthopedic area, right? I, I understand um, how orthopedic products are sold. Um, the model that is used in orthopedics, and we are in the orthopedics field, is absolutely wrong for our product. And if we took that model and tried to use it with our product, we would fail. And the reason is, is because our product is extremely disruptive and potentially could change the standard of care. When you look at orthopedics, um, li you know, largely, um, there, it's, it's converging on commoditization. So there's a way to sell those products that works. When you get a, a product that is highly disruptive, you have to really rethink what is the best strategy. So for instance, we've hired very few, if any, orthopedic reps, believe it or not. You know where we're hiring from? Cardiology. We're hiring from the cardiology area because I believe that we can teach, if they're smart, we can teach them the technology. What we can't necessarily teach them is how to sell a disruptive technology. And that's very different coming out of the orthopedic world. So I think that you know, my experience has really um, helped me in that respect. Yeah. I, I like the sell the disruptive technology piece. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think in settings like this, we don't talk often a lot because we we talk about the technology and we talk about reimbursement and we talk about the regulatory pathway. And I always feel like sort of the, the marketing people never get a bone thrown their way. Um, so I won't go directly to marketing, but I'll ask a visibility question. So, you know, obviously, you know, both of you found it important enough to give a night up to sit in front of an audience, create visibility both for your companies and to share your expertise. Um, so many mediums to do it today, so many existing restrictions and so many as yet to be determined restrictions around the way our industry communicates. How important, how critical is it to, for a company to find a way to get heard through so much noise today? How important is it to have that visibility with, with customers, with physicians, um, with peers, and in the media? Is it more important and is it harder than it's been in the past? And it's definitely important from a standpoint of customers, you know, in particular if you don't have a large organization to be able to, you know, go out and touch those doctors on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, from our standpoint, we put a tremendous amount into peer-to-peer um, -peer development, and it's that, uh, you know, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you know, essentially getting doctors that work with other doctors, that becomes for us a significant outlet and a source of um, awareness around Intellis. Uh, and then part of that, of course, is just raw market development. 
And we have um, a lot of effort and energy, both in IntelliSense and prior experiences I have, but just you know, educating and developing that market, especially if you've got a therape an innovative therapeutic technology uh, that I think we all have. So, uh, so I would say that's the, the biggest area of focus is around, obviously, the customers. I, I don't think, you know, the media can be helpful when it comes, and I, I say that more thinking about medical device media, when it comes to trying to create awareness around your business, especially if you're anticipating yeah. the desire to um, get partnerships, alliances, acquisition, that kind of thing. So you, you got to be careful. You don't want to basically blow out of smoke without substance behind it. But I, I do think it's important to make sure folks are aware and paying attention so that when the day comes, you know, they're, they're sort of a little bit up the learning curve. Yeah. Um, so less important, but certainly something to be mindful of. Yeah, I, I agree with Bob. I think that it depends on what you want to do. What are your goals, right? So when we were trying to keep going, okay. Bob, if you have your cell phone in your pocket, turn it off. That might be the problem. Um, when we were out trying to raise money, we were we were spending a lot of time on PR, trying to create an awareness and a buzz about us, uh, just sort of to pave the way, right? When we commercialized, um, we've really um, re sort of pivoted and started focusing on what's it gonna take to drive adoption. And again, this is, you know, you have, you need to understand what do you have, how disruptive is it, and what's it gonna take to get adoption. And so for us, like Bob, peer to peer, um, medical education events are where we're spending a lot of our time. Now, we're focused on driving awareness and credibility and belief among the physicians. Where we're using PR today, and, and as Bob mentioned, I mean, we're, we've made a decision um, to focus, go deep, not try to be everything to everyone. So we're not everywhere in the United States. But where we are going deep, where we're using PR, is to help our physicians educate their patients. So rather than use social media, which would just blast out there, that's not in alignment with our plan, right? Because we're going, we're focused. What we want to do is create an opportunity for our physicians to get um, the word out there and be able to educate their patients. So for example, we had a physician, we have a PR package. We gave that to the physician. He put out a press release. He also tweeted. He um, was then picked up by a local radio station. He did an interview. And from that, he got picked up by CBS. And he, um, CBS in Philly and in New Jersey, and they aired uh, a piece about him and our technology um, last Friday night on the 11 o'clock news. That surgeon, um, so it aired Friday night at 11 o'clock. By Monday morning, that surgeon had more than 20 patients calling him, asking him about the technology. Um, and in fact, he, he had done you know, a certain number of um, uh, procedures with us in the first nine months of this year, and in one month he doubled what he was doing in, in terms of procedures. So, it, you know, I think you got to really figure out what is what are your goals, and then align your communications, PR, education plans to what you're trying to do. And of course, utilize Mass Device and Life Science Alley as content <laughs> distributors, right? Uh, yes, you give really <laughs> good meals. Critical. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> the food is good. <laughs> you know, as we hit a quarter to, to nine here, um, would love to wind up, but want to give each of you, um, you know, just kind of the last word. So again, um, you know, a lot of change, a lot of evolution. You're both right in the middle of it. So, you know, as we move through 2015 into 2016, um, you know, what are what are some things that we should expect to see around the M and A market? more or less money, and perhaps most importantly, uh, how are you both preparing your team uh, for success 
in this market over the coming year. So, Bob, last word. Well, you always have a way of asking like 18 questions in I one. So I know. I used to be I used to I can pick the ones I that I want to answer yeah. out, <laughs> skip the other ones. By the way, it's completely coincidence that as soon as I put my phone down on the floor that it stopped making that racket. So, um, <laughs> so where do I start with that? Um, I, one, I would, one question, first, whatever you want to talk about okay. at the end. Right. <laughs> uh, so I, I would say that I, I'm pretty optimistic about the medical device sector. I think the fact that the, the IPO market has reopened, I mean, we all have gotten to a low point here in terms of venture spend, but, but I, we do know because there have been some great exits and luckily we've been one of them, you know, knock on wood so far, that that gets the attention of investors and it does start with the public markets, the hedge funds get involved, eventually it moves to the venture sector and that money begins to come back a bit. So I don't know if it'll look like it did 10 years ago, but I do think we're on an upswing in terms of, um, it's not my phone. <laughs> um, that one's Brian. Oh, that's fault. perfect. That's, that's his Brian. fault. <laughs> um, so, but in any case, I do think we're on the upswing in terms of uh, opportunity uh, relative to venture capital coming back into the marketplace. Yeah. And then at the same time, the other good part about this is that the angel market has grown yeah. significantly. Yeah. And you see that even at later stage companies where you've got some very significant angel dollars out there that were never available 10 or 15 years ago, thanks to a lot of great exits and even some of the other sectors as you, these folks look to diversify. So, so that for me is exciting. You know, I think from the standpoint of the team, obviously that is everything that we're about. So our ability to keep um, energizing and making sure that the team is uh, thinking about a bright and exciting future, painting that vision and making sure that both internally and then we project that ex externally is, is, is how we operate. And our ability to do that will, I think, hopefully lead to some level of success. We'll see how much that is. But, uh, but that certainly is what, what I think about an awful lot. And uh, I think ultimately what we're hopefully going to be about. But I thank you for the chance to yeah. be here tonight. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, there is a lot of money out there. And in fact, um, there is a lot of cash on a lot of the strategics balance sheet, and they've got to put it to work. I was talking to an investment banker last week. He told me that uh, one company, not to be named in this room, um, has been their, their management's been given the mandate to go out and find disruptive technologies and don't lose it to competition. That bodes well for um, really good technologies that are disruptive. I, um, look, if we could do it, if we could raise money, I think that um, it, it can be done. And um, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a full-time job. And I think somebody was talking about how distracting it is. But um, I would say, don't give up. Just stay the course and, and double down. And for us at Rotation Medical, um, you know, 2016 is going to be a um, really big value creation year for us. We're just focusing on um, building a commercial traction. Martha, Bob. Thank you, sincerely, thank you both so much for coming out and sharing your story and um, you know, helping the community to learn from your experiences. <laughs> thank uh, you. And again, let's hear a round of applause. For <laughs> thank you. One thing, in my mention of the top 100 medical device companies, I left out 3M Healthcare, which is my bad and really ridiculous considering they're one of the biggest companies in the world. And they are right here. Uh, can you stand up, Robert, John, and the other gentleman for 3M? I want to recognize them as well. And I want to recognize all of you for staying out. Thank you for bearing with us in the little delays. This is Device Talks Minnesota, and we'll be back. And we'll uh, see some of you at AdvaMed and uh, San Diego. We'll see some of you back here for MedTech Week in November. And we'll see you back here next year. So on behalf of everybody, thank you very much for coming tonight. And can I have my big 100 companies and my ones to watch right up here? Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.